Well, people are beginning to sit back down. I'll just say a few things. Um, first of all, it's a it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very impressed by the um, attention to quality and monitoring and data systems and the importance of uh, learning as you go that seems to characterize um, certainly Toronto, uh, if not Ottawa as a whole, um, Ontario as a whole. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I do know where I am. <laughs> Um, and it's always very humbling to come from the United States to virtually any other country, and certainly Canada, because we um, have the most inadequate early childhood education system in the industrialized world, <laughs> just south of here, and um, starting with our pitiful family leave policy. Um, so it, there's always this little bit, you know, who am I to come here and talk to you? But I am going to share with you um, some good news and a success story um, in Tulsa. And I'm so glad we studied Tulsa instead of Oklahoma City because Tulsa to Toronto makes such a great little title <laughs> for a talk, which is not why we chose Tulsa, but, um, but we would have if we'd known. Um, I, a couple things I just want to put like post-it notes on at the beginning. One is um, uh, uh, Mikhail mention the states that are doing QRIS systems in the United States where they're up to you know, six or seven. It hasn't grown tremendously. But there is um, new proposed federal legislation called the Early Learning Challenge Fund in the United States. It has passed the House of Representatives, but not the Senate, which seems to be the story of so many legislative proposals in the United States. Um, and it would create a, na not a national QRIS system per se, but would require each state to develop a QRIS system. It includes um, a, um, the, the QRIS systems that each state would need to create would cut across child care, head start, pre-K, um, would um, be from birth to five, and would, it also entails money for a national evaluation of the legislation. Um, I'm optimistic, but I'm optimistic by nature that you know sooner or later, once we deal with health care and well, which we have sort of, and oil spills, <laughs> oil spills, and the financial disaster that we have in my country, um, maybe we'll turn to the early, uh, early learning challenge fund. Um, I. I think, you know, if there's a theme to the talks that you've heard, um, and, and it really does come from our hearts as well as our minds, is that we want to move from a situation where we think about early childhood programs as slots for children <laughs> to thinking about them as providing environments in, in which young children can grow and learn and maybe, maybe, maybe even thrive. Um, wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, uh, and it's really, certainly in the United States, moving from a sense of, if you will, national responsibility for eliminating unsafe environments, which presumably our child care licensing system does, although it doesn't. We had a Consumer Product Safety Commission study done um, taking a random sample of licensed centers and family daycare homes in the United States. It's about a decade old now. I would love to see this redone. And they found significant safety violations in two-thirds of licensed centers and homes. Um, I mean, everything from stairs without gates at the top to blinds with the loop chains down where kids to recalled safety equipment. So licensing is, is not even getting to safety in the United States, at least. So kind of a precautionary comment. Um, the other thing I, I just, the other sort of post-it note is I would like to talk about um, uh, the fact that we don't have any data on thresholds. And we have come to kind of reify certain points on these quality scales and say, if you just get to here, it'll be okay. And in truth, we don't know if that's okay. <laughs> we don't know if a three is okay. We really don't even know if a four is okay or a five. In, we tempted to look for threshold effects in the NICHD uh, daycare study, this big national 10-site study. Um, and to the extent that we had any evidence of where you start seeing, you know, really good developmental outcomes, it was up at sixes and sevens. 
Um, so there is some work being done in the United States right now, not by me, by a wonderful investigator named Peg Birchenall, to look exactly at that question. How far do you have to get up these quality scales before you start seeing really uh, strong benefits? Not, not even strong, just you know, significant benefits for, for children. Um, so this is Tulsa, pretty far from Toronto. <laughs> Um, and Tulsa is a really interesting little place to do research. Um, I've come to really love Tulsa. You can get great cowboy boots at low cost. <laughs> and <laughs> um, it was, ironically, the site of the first QRS system in the United States. So it's very odd to think of Oklahoma as this incredibly progressive state, but in terms of early childhood policy, it actually is. Um, in 1990, the state of Oklahoma um, created a uh, preschool program, school-based preschool program for four-year-olds who were of low income. And in 1998, they decided to make the program universal. 99% um, of all school districts in Oklahoma participate in the program. We studied Tulsa because it is, for a couple reasons, but the, the main reason going in was that it is the largest school district in Oklahoma. Um, highly diverse, you can get large samples of white kids, black kids, Hispanic kids, and Native Americans. So it's a very interesting place to, to study. Um, the cost per child, um, this is about three years old now, is close to $4,000 a year. It's embedded in the formula for state education. It's not a separate funding stream, which um, makes it a very stable program, not uh, vulnerable to the vicissitudes of changing uh, political winds in the state of Oklahoma. Um, it is now number one statewide in the penetration rate of pre-K, so over 70%, and this number just keeps growing, of four-year-olds in Oklahoma go to their, um, uh, go to school, basically. School starts at four years of age in, uh, in Oklahoma. Um, it is high quality in a, in a, um, structural quality sense of the term in that all lead teachers have to have a BA degree. They have to be certified to be an early childhood teacher. Uh, importantly, and I will come back to this, they are paid at public school wages and receive public school benefits. So if you want to teach a four-year-old, you, you can. You, you don't have to teach a five-year-old to double your wages, which is true in childcare. Um, kindergarten teachers in the United States earn at least twice as much as comparably educated child care workers. Um, so there's no disincentive to teach little kids if, if, if that's what you love to do, um, and the ratios are there for you to see. Um, the other thing about Tulsa is that it's sort of researchers' heaven. Um, in that, um, even before we entered the scene, uh, my colleague and I, William Gormley, political scientist at Georgetown University, um, they tested every child on a little homegrown, literally, do you know your colors, can you count a little bit, can you write a letter, kind of very face valid um, learning test, the, um, the week before they entered kindergarten and the week before they entered preschool. <laughs> and they have a strict birthday cutoff in um, Tulsa. So if you were born September 1 or later, you can go to preschool as a four-year-old. If you were born the day before September 1, does August have 31 days? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, August 31, you can't. You have to wait a year, and they enforce it very, very strictly. Um, the third thing they had in Tulsa was a superintendent of schools who was both curious and brave. Um, he really wanted to know the impacts of spending state education funds on the preschool program. Because as you know, there are many competing opportunities to spend money in an education budget. Um, for example, in Oklahoma, moving to full day kindergarten. Um, now they've done that as well. But um, uh, he really wanted to make sure that he was spending his money wisely. Um, and um, I say he was brave because to have especially outside evaluators come in and look at a program rigorously runs the risk, of course, of learning that it doesn't work. Um, now, fortunately, we found that it does. But um, it takes a lot of courage to, um, to do evidence-based policy. 
and it takes a lot of courage on the part of policymakers because they run the risk of uh, learning that they've made a mistake um, and wasted a lot of money. Um, I'm not going to go into this. I can come back to this because I actually think here in Toronto you have an amazing opportunity to come really close to an experimental design in looking at um, the, um, the impacts of shifting to a full day program um, in your, um, what do you call it? Um, not pre-K. Junior and senior kindergarten. Yeah, for four-year-olds basically four and five year olds. Uh, partly because you're doing a staggered Im implementation from what I understand, I think you probably do have strict age cutoffs. Um, so you, and it's just then a matter of layering on testing. Now in Oklahoma, we actually convinced them to use the Woodcock-Johnson test um, after our initial evaluation showing positive effects from their homegrown test. It required <coughs> training teachers, totally doable. So I'd be happy to talk about that later if you like, <laughs> no, I'm going to it now. Here, here's the good news. <laughs> so um, this was the, this is the Woodcock-Johnson data, cognitive test score gains. And what we're comparing here, think about it as a child born on September 1 to a child born on August 31st. Um, and that's the only difference between the kids in pre-K uh, and the kids not. So we were able to compare the kids at the end of a pre-K year being tested right before they entered kindergarten, and the kids right before they started pre-K, which controls pretty well for selection because you have every single family in the sample wanting to do pre-K. <laughs> um, and then, of course, we control for all sorts of things anyway, but they were pretty well balanced. And what you find, you think of five, the 5.0, I should draw a line acro across it, as where, if you will, five-year-olds are supposed to be, right? The red bar are the kids who had had a year of pre-K. The yellow bar are the kids who are about to start pre-K and hadn't had it yet. So that you can see in terms of um, early literacy, or, which is letter word identification at these ages, um, the kids are seven months ahead of the game at the point that they're starting kindergarten. Um, six months ahead of the game in spelling. And the applied problems is early math learning, four months ahead of the game. Um, this was, we, we cut up the sample any way we could. This was true of wealthy kids as well as poor kids. Um, it was true for white kids as well as non-white kids. It was most true, <laughs> the group that showed even the strongest impacts, even a more dramatic picture if I were to put it up, were the English language learners, were the Hispanic children. We went back and administered the Woodcock Johnson in Spanish and English and found that the kids who were Spanish speaking did well on both versions. So what they're getting is a double whammy because they're learning English and they're learning uh, content um, at the same time. So that gives them a huge boost. There is no Spanish immersion. This is English, 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 English. <laughs> um, social developmental outcomes. Um, you know, some people think that if you really pay a lot of attention to cognitive development, these are all school-based, I should say, programs that we're looking at here, uh, in school, on the school grounds, um, that somehow you're going to make these kids really anxious and, um, and harm their social development. Not true. That the children, and again, the, um, uh, the blue bars, the kids who've been through, through um, preschool, um, uh, yeah, at the end of the preschool year, starting kindergarten, um, this shows attentiveness data, kids who can sit still, pay attention, listen, do what the teacher tells them to do. Um, the kids who had been through preschool were much better at that than the kids who had not had it yet. Um, and we also found some evidence in terms of timidity. Um, I think if, if you put timi you know, lower timidity, higher attention, these are kids who, kids who you basically taught to be good students. They're engaged. They are um, involved in the learning activities. They know how to follow directions. And, and teachers love kids like that, right? Um, so now the question is why? What on earth is Tulsa doing um, that accounts for these outcomes? And we don't have the full story yet, but it's maybe hard for you to see. Let me, I'll walk you through it. Um, we went into every single preschool classroom, um, 80 of them, in Tulsa and spent a full day observing quality. 
we used a measure called the class, um, classroom blah, 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 assessment something. It's, it is different than the efforts. It, it is more focused on educational environments. It includes a lot of items about um, it, the instructional climate and quality in the classroom, much more so than the Eckers does. It also, however, captures a whole bunch of items on the emotional climate in the classroom. So, um, and we found that the Eckers really did not work very well in Tulsa in terms of we did a little pilot study predicting child outcomes, whereas the class did in the, in the environment of preschool classrooms. Um, so, um, and in fact, what we then did is there's a wonderful, huge study in 11 states, 12, 11 I think, of using the class of preschool settings um, in states that um, much more typically provide four-year-old preschool across auspices. So child care centers, Head Start programs, school-based classrooms, uh, mixed delivery, unlike Oklahoma. And we were able to get their data. They provided their data very generously to us so we could compare the class store scores in Tulsa to the class scores in these other states, um, pre preschool programs. Um, and we restricted our comparisons because of the Tulsa standards in terms of who could teach to classrooms in these other states that had a BA level teacher with an early childhood certification to create, as, as best we could, a level playing ground. And we found that Tulsa was better. <laughs> Tulsa had higher scores on the class in terms of productivity, um, learning formats, concept development, and quality of feedback. Now, the kinds of things that that's capturing are effective time management on the part of the teacher, use of instructional techniques that maximize student engagement and learning, reliance on lessons and activities that promote higher order thinking skills, and provision of feedback that isn't just you did well or you did poorly, but actually expands learning. So it's really stretching the children's um, cognitive development. Okay, we also um, looked at where the teachers are spending their time in the classrooms using part of a measure developed by Carolee Howes at UCLA. Um, and you literally just code um, how much time is spent on literacy activities, math activities, social studies activities, you name it, science. And here again, the blue bar is Tulsa. Sorry, I didn't tell you that before, maybe you did. The blue bar is Tulsa, the red bar is the, are the other states. Don't worry about the others. We also looked at Head Start programs in Tulsa that did better than Head Start programs nationally, but not as well as the school-based programs. So blue bar, red bar, a lot more time on literacy activities, and a lot more time on math in the Tulsa preschool programs than in the other states' uh, preschool programs. Also true of science, um, social studies, not, not. <laughs> but it turns out it doesn't matter, social studies. <laughs> because the social studies in this measure also includes a lot of fantasy play, which is kind of a muddy measure. It's not exactly learning where the learning where Toronto is, for example. But um, then we went to see, okay, what is it that predicts higher quality classrooms? Because even in this wonderful preschool system, we had very poor quality classrooms as well as very high quality. It's not that they had eliminated variation in quality, it's just the average was quite high. But we still had some programs scoring down at the two, three level in Tulsa. And I saw some horrific stuff going on in these classrooms that um, I can share over lunch maybe <laughs> in confidence. Um, and we, because you know, everyone wants to know, how can we find the right teachers? How can we do the right things to get to this level of quality? What's going on? Um, because every teacher, and in our comparison schools, also had a BA and an early childhood certification, we couldn't look at that. Um, we couldn't look at ratios or group size because that's consistent in Tulsa. So we looked at whether their early childhood education, uh, sorry, whether their BA was in child development or early childhood education. They had to have the certification, but their BA could have been in anything. We looked at whether they had a master's degree. We looked at their years of classroom experience. We looked at their undergraduate grade point average. We looked at half day versus full day programs, and we looked at curricula, what curricula, if any, they use. Tulsa does not, Oklahoma does not require 
curriculum that teachers get to pick. And in fact, most teachers blend a lot of different curricula. They use curricula, but they're, they, they blend the best of, I think, you know, a lot of different things. Um, and the only predictor that we had was teacher experience. <laughs> And this wasn't an, an impact of brand new teachers. Um, this wasn't just first year teachers often, first and second year teachers often are still on a pretty steep learning curve. It was just linear. So go figure um, on that. So we've thought a lot about what is going on and we don't really have an answer. Um, there is some evidence from one of our longitudinal data sets in the United States that programs that are actually based in elementary schools produce better outcomes than programs that are elsewhere, maybe smoothing the transition for kids to kindergarten, literally. Um, was it because of the nature of the student body? Were these kids just easy to teach? No, two thirds of the kids in these programs um, are in poverty. Um, this is what I think the magic bullet is, <laughs> and we haven't talked about this yet. Um, I, think it's, I think there's something about the wages here because I think it's keeping highly qualified teachers who need to earn a living wage in the early childhood field. Um, and in fact, in Tulsa, not only are they earning as much as a fifth grade teacher um, or a 12th grade teacher, um, but they, um, they are earning about the average wage in Tulsa. <laughs> um, so they can have a really decent standard of living as a preschool teacher um, in Tulsa. Um, other candidates that I think need to be considered and we just don't know in Tulsa for sure, I think teachers' mental health is a huge issue. I looked in another study at rates of depression among child care providers and they were at 23 to 30 percent in centers and homes. And we know what depressed mothers do to kids. <laughs> Uh, unwittingly, um, I shouldn't put it that way. So I don't, I don't think having depressed teachers is a great idea. Um, depression in this other study was correlated with harsh and insensitive caregiving, not surprisingly. Um, I think um, people need to look at teacher motivation and commitment to teaching. Um, there, there, I've seen early childhood teachers who just, and elementary teachers as well, who would rather not be there, and that's not so good for kids. Um, uh, Krista mentioned leadership, huge issue. I think the leadership support is profound and part of what has happened in Tulsa, of course, is that the business community, the political community is so proud now of their preschool program um, that it's really kind of sexy to teach in pre-K in Tulsa. Imagine that, you know, that's kind of <laughs> different. Um, so I'm gonna jump way ahead and you can have these slides, it's fine. Um, and just um, close, actually, by talking a little bit about why should we bother? Not that in this room we wonder why we need to bother, but I will share one other um, piece of research evidence that I'm just beginning to get out. The Tulsa story. Oh, we are also, I should, one more thing on Tulsa. We are now looking at the relationship between classroom quality and the child outcome data, and it is it is related, <laughs> so stay tuned. It does matter for kids, by the way, and we will try to look at this issue of thresholds. I don't have an answer for you yet from Tulsa. Um, I'm not going to go into the NICHD evidence because that's been a big deal in the United States, and I don't know what extent it is here. But I do want to tell um, a new story that is emerging from data in the United States, which is a story about stress um, and brain development as it relates to early childhood quality. Um, and what we're finding, um, this is work I do with uh, Megan Gunner at the University of Minnesota and Nathan Fox at the University of Maryland. Um, uh, and we are collecting samples of cortisol in children um, at home and in childcare. Normal cortisol development in kids, it drops over the course of the day. It's like you wake up, and, and adults too. Um, not babies, but <laughs> young kids and adults. It's like you wake up at the beginning of the day ready for anything, and your cortisol levels are high, and you're all revved up, and it's like, then as the day goes on, you kind of relax. It's like, oh, God, good, you know, a lion's not going to come out of the woods and charge you. So, you, so your cortisol levels kind of drop. Kids, in, there's a group of kids, and we're beginning to figure out who they are and the conditions where the cortisol levels go up over the course of the day, which is an issue for you here as you're moving to full day, right? Um, and about 40% of the kids um, actually are reaching levels that um, 
people who understand uh, the, the biology of stress tell us are of concern, that these kids are really experiencing a stress response. Um, it, um, what, what it is related to is two things. Kids who experience harsh, insensitive caregiving, over-controlling caregiving, um, their cortisol levels go up. Second factor that matters is temperament. Kids who by disposition, I think of them as extremely shy, we call them inhibited, um, socially reticent, seem to have sort of a predilection or a vulnerability to experiencing higher stress levels. Um, especially when they're under conditions of very harsh caregiving. Um, so I support um, uh, uh, McCall's <laughs> um, uh, recommendation to look at caregiver sensitivity and harshness as part of what you do, because if I could pick two things to look at, I would look at that. I would look at over-control and harshness, and we could talk about what that means. Um, and I would look at compensation. Um, maybe depression as well, but I think that's a proxy for harshness. So um, I'm going to end there. And thank you, people. <laughs>